You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 23, 2011, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Ethics in Pediatric Research. Our presenter is Dr. John Lantos. He's the Director of Children's Mercy Bioethics Center at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Got, um, this is Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. Today is September 23rd, 2011. We're joined this morning by Dr. John Lantos. Dr. Lantos is a bioethicist. Uh, he's in charge of the uh, bioethics uh, department here at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics and has agreed kindly to speak with us today about ethics in pediatric research. So welcome to Conferences Online Allergy, Dr. Lantos. Here's the keyboard, and here's the uh, presentation. Okay, so um, you know I could either go through slides in a formal presentation, or if you'd rather, you could just like ask questions about ethics and pediatric research, the protocols you want to do, IRBs, or yeah, it might help if you do some of your slides, and that way we can, it may, be, it may spur some questions. Okay. Let's see. Oh, oh, that forward arrow. There forward we go. Arrow. There we go. Um, so the tensions in ethics and pediatric research are pretty clear. People have always argued about the whole process of consent and risk-benefit assessment. It goes back to at least Nuremberg and probably before that, where the question is, uh, how do you do research on people who can't consent? And the Nuremberg rules were clear after the Nazi doctor trials that doing research on people who can't consent was illegal, unjustified, unethical, and wrong. And that presents a problem for pediatric research, research with demented elderly, research with incompetent patients, emergency research. There's a whole series of, there's a whole bunch of categories of research that it's impossible to get consent from the research subject. So um, you either say, and I'll go through some uh, slides on uh, some people who have said this, you either say, well, you just can't do it, or else you say, you got to be able to do it, because otherwise um, everybody, will, everybody will be harmed. If you don't do any research, you never learn anything. Everybody's harmed. So some people have to be harmed for the benefit of others, assuming research is risky. So how do you come up with rules to uh, ensure that the harms are minimized, the benefits are maximized, and the risks are shared um, justly? Is, is that a valid uh, assumption, though? Is all research risky? As I think that is not a valid assumption, although that is the assumption that guides the moral framework and the regulatory framework of research. Oh. I think there's actually some really good data, and I've actually written about this, that children in randomized controlled trials are safer than children outside of randomized controlled trials. Although part of the, it's, it's partly an argument that turns on whether they're safer because you have a structure of oversight. Yeah, so before you can do a randomized controlled trial, you have to carefully design the trial, and people have to assess it for the risks and benefits, and you have to have monitoring and safety review boards in place. As a result, with that whole system of oversight, I think research, for the most part, has become safer than uh, clinical care. So it is a paradox. You know, you could argue that that kind of oversight should be applied to all clinical care, not just to research. You should, I, I would argue that and agree, although oversight is expensive. Yeah. So the question becomes, how much do you want to spend on oversight, uh, and where do you, and if you have limited resources to spend on oversight, where are you going to spend your limited resources to get the maximum bang for your oversight buck? Oh. I'm involved in a bitter argument on a bioethics chat line. Even as we speak, I was posting, it's one of the reasons I was late, about minimal risk research and things that get expedited review. And the current system, I think, is wildly irrational uh, in the sense that 
like if, if I wanted to do a survey of you all to ask like what your career choices are going to be, whether you want to go into academics or um, uh, private practice, before I could do that survey, I would have to submit it to the IRB, and they would say, this is low risk. Go ahead, which is really dumb, and it would take three months. And uh, so I, I make the analogy that would be like requiring everybody before they drive to work to file a flight plan. They're like, I'm going to obey the speed limit rules, and I'm going to try really hard and not to hit pedestrians. And sort of if someone is offended by the loud noise of my car, I will have an 800 number for them to call so they can get counseling to make sure that the stress of having me drive by didn't hurt them. <laughs> and you'd also have to apply an attestation that you were the driver. Right. <laughs> and that's our current system, which is nuts. Uh, and at the same time, there are surgeons and neonatologists doing wildly innovative things, but they don't do it under a protocol, so nobody's no. overseeing them, and nobody knows whether they're getting appropriate consent. And so it's a, it's a system that's out of whack. And so I, I always wonder when I come talk to people, like, should I teach you the system that you're going to have to live with, <laughs> and that is full of irrationalities, or should I critique the system? And not really do you a service if you ever want to become a researcher. And what I usually choose to do is try to teach you the system and then go underneath it a little bit, how we got, how it got that way and how it might change. Keep keeping in mind, of course, that if you uh, indicate the, the irrationalities and create independent thinkers, then these are the people who might change that system at some point. That would, yeah, that would be my hope. And, and uh, the, the OHRP, Office of Human Research Protection, which is the federal agency that oversees IRBs and clinical research in health and human services, is a separate one, the FDA, and they have slightly different. But OHRP and the FDA actually got together and have proposed a revision of the current rules precisely to address some of these expedited review minimal risk studies, and that's working its way through the government process and it's out for public comment now. There was an article in the New England Journal a couple of weeks ago by Jerry Menikoff and Zeke Emanuel. Zeke used to run the NIH's um, bioethics department, and Jerry used to be uh, on the faculty at KU, and now is the head of OHRP. And the two of them have put this together. So people are trying to change it, but it moves slowly, and public perception is still that research is very risky, and renegade researchers can't be trusted. Uh, with good reason. So, just for fun, who's heard of Willowbrook? Do you know any? Do you know anything about the Willowbrook hepatitis experiment? So, these are. This was a set of experiments that, in some ways, led to the debate about whether researchers can be trusted, whether research is risky, and whether we need regulation. And it's a great story. So, I'm going to tell you, even though it's more medical history than currently. Oops. Uh, so this guy was the principal investigator, Saul Krugman, who um, went on to win the John Howland Award, which is the highest award given by the American Pediatric Society, which is the elite academic pediatric society. So this is like you're the best researcher in the world award. And Saul Krugman won, won it. When he died, the New York Times said, this guy did more to eliminate pediatric infectious diseases than anybody ever. Hot shot guy. What did he do? He did studies at the Willowbrook State School. Forget about that one. Uh, that it's still sort of unclear what he did, but if you look in textbooks of pediatric bioethics and research ethics, Willowbrook and Tuskegee are usually in the same paragraph, and sometimes they throw in Nazi experiments as well. So it's up there as sort of a paradigm case of research abuse. But Tuskegee, you've all heard of. Mm -hmm. You've seen the play. There's an <laughs> official history. There's a presidential apology to the survivors of Tuskegee. So everybody sort of knows that. Although I bet if I asked you, you wouldn't. You'd have some misperceptions about that. I'm not going to talk about that. Willowbrook never got that, so nobody knows quite for sure what happened. Except that, unlike Tuskegee, a 
lot of the papers were actually um, published in leading medical journals, so you can go back and try to piece together what happened. 10 or 15 years of studies. Basically, Willowbrook was a, school, a, a residential facility for kids with disabilities of all sorts, mental retardation, motor disabilities. It was unclear who exactly got in there. It was the 50s diagnostic criteria were a little vague. And Willowbrook was built for 1,500 kids, and by the mid-50s was holding 6,000 kids. Massive overcrowding, endemic infectious disease, including hepatitis, which at that time nobody knew what caused it or um, how to uh, prevent it. And so Saul Krugman and his colleagues set out to figure that out. And they did a series of studies that involved both the staff and the patients, or the residents, both of whom had high rates of hepatitis. And hepatitis at that time was diagnosed by liver enzymes and clinical jaundice, because nobody knew that it was viral, and nobody knew that there were many different viruses. And so they were sort of vague diagnoses. You can't rise in liver enzymes. Yeah. Whether they really had a hep B or something else causing their liver enzymes and jaundice in this cesspool of infectious disease was hard to know. But how did they do it? They did some observational studies. They watched kids who were admitted to Willowbrook and charted how long it took them before they got hepatitis. They tried gamma globulin, which was available. But in the most controversial part, they took some kids and moved them to what was essentially a GCRC, a clinical research center, and deliberately exposed them to bodily fluids that were derived from patients who were clinically jaundiced. And they did it for two reasons. One was apparently to test the efficacy of gamma globulin to prevent infections. They couldn't gamma globulin give some kids placebo, expose them both to. Um, and the exposure was both IM and oral. And the bodily fluids were mostly derived from stool, because it was fecal oral transmission. So it kind of looked bad. Um, and But some of them were using these bodily fluids in what they claimed was a sort of early um, uh, beta model of a vaccine. They said if we deliberately infect them with a small dose, maybe they'll get a mild case of hepatitis, and that'll protect them from getting more serious. So they claimed that these were actually therapeutic studies done for the benefit of the children. And um, in the course of this work, did uh, isolate the viruses, and eventually a lot of this work was the basis for the development of both Hep A and Hep B vaccines and our current understanding of hepatitis. All the studies were done with consent from the parents, although they've never published the consent forms. There's never been a lawsuit from any parent of Willowbrook against these investigators. In fact, there are parents groups who have given Saul Krugman awards for his pioneering work, and they're enormously grateful. And as I say, the papers were published in the New England Journal and JAMA and Lancet with no sort of editorial comments that this was at all ethically problematic. Until 1966, the wrote, when Henry Beecher, who was an anesthesiologist at Harvard, wrote a paper in the New England Journal where he described 20 clinical research projects that had been published in the last 10 years in the New England Journal and highlighted the ethical uh, transgressions that he claimed took place. And if you ever want to read an interesting study about whether research is risky or whether people need oversight, this paper and then the 20 studies that he describes are pretty interesting because sort of in the 50s and early 60s, docs and academic medical centers were cowboys. I mean, they would do like uh, transesophageal cardiac biopsies just to see, you know, how the heart muscle worked. <laughs> and uh, the radiation experiments that were done for the subject of a uh, presidential bioethics council inquiry. There's a whole lots of people were deliberately given radioactive material just to see whether it would cause uh, you know bone marrow problems. People were injected with live cancer cells. I mean, there's all sorts of wild stuff done in leading academic medical centers. And he highlighted Krugman, Krugman's Willowbrook studies as one of those. 
And this was before there were IRBs, before there was any requirement for oversight, and really before there was kind of bioethics, the way we think about it now. The first bioethics center in the United States was the Hastings Center, which was founded in 1969. This was 66. This was before the Tuskegee story broke. So it was sort of a pioneering study, and it led some of the first bioethicists around, including this guy, Paul Ramsey, who was a theologian at Princeton and one of the first theologians or philosophers to start looking at what was going on in medical centers and think about the theological, philosophical implications. And he wrote a book, The Patient as Person. And he made the argument, basically, this is a violation of not just Nuremberg codes and the need for consent, but fundamental ethics that you just should not ever, ever do research on captive populations of children that is not for their benefit, even with consent. Parents shouldn't be allowed to consent to it. It's just wrong. It should never be done. And he acknowledged we lose information. And we may not be able to advance science. But he still thought it was so egregious that it shouldn't be done. And it led to an interesting debate that, again, for people who are sort of interested in the underpinnings of our current system, the debate between these two theologians, one a Protestant and one a Catholic, and they published papers sort of back and forth over about five years in these bioethics journals, just ripping each other apart by name. I mean, it's, and they're both really smart, really passionate, and really witty. So when they go after each other, it's <clears throat> sort of fun to read. But they made two different arguments, which the, and the tension between the two, I think, is where what led to the system that we have now. Ramsey, as I said, said it should never be done. To experiment on children is a sanitized form of barbarism, and we should accept, accept no exceptions. McCormick took the position that I think is closer to most of ours, although he took it more from a Catholic moral theology position than from, I think, what's more customary, which is kind of the utilitarian position utilitarian position says most good for the most people. Some people may have to suffer as long as they don't suffer too much. And the benefit to everybody else is so good, that's morally justifiable. He started there. He said it protects a child so absolutely that it undermines the overall good of children. But then he went a little further and said even eventually of the individual child. So there's a little bit of that risk thing. Although he didn't argue that children were safer research studies. Instead, what he argued was children and everybody else ought to care about the community. We're all part of the human community. Medical knowledge is a collective good. And therefore, we all have a moral obligation to participate in research studies. And if you take this seriously, it would mean you shouldn't need to get consent maybe even from competent adults, that sort of there should be studies that we should just be able to do. Something that has sort of what goes around comes around. It's kind of come back in biobanking arguments and arguments for using newborn screening specimens for public health research. Those are specimens that are collected without anybody's consent. In fact, they're mandated, and they're sitting now in uh, storage facilities in every state, and a lot of researchers say, I am this is the treasure trove, this is the gold mine. Think of the genetic research you could do, especially if you could link it to their medical records, and especially if you could do it in a de-identified way so that nobody would know why, why not use that stuff. People should do it. Everybody should participate in research. It's kind of what philosophers and theologians would call a natural law argument. This is the way the world ought to work, and therefore this is the way you ought to behave. And he said, when, pe when kids grow up who found out that they could have participated in a study and weren't allowed to because idiots like Ramsey have this idea that it's a violation of our, then they're going to say, I don't have to feel bad. I would have consented if I could have because I ought to have. Um, so Ramsey focused on consent, McCormick on what we ought to do just because we're human beings. Uh, how much time do we have? 10.30? Yeah. Uh, 
little longer than the end. This is interesting. You want to get to like IRB regulation? Yeah, we're, we're, we're totally captivated. Okay. I can't, so these guys are so so interesting. So these guys were arguing this out, and uh, the AAP got involved. And uh, at that time, the head of the AAP's committee on bioethics was a guy named Bill Bartholomew, who was a pediatrician at KU, and one of the people who was uh, the strongest advocate I think that there's ever been for children's rights. He's the guy who pretty much invented the concept of assent. So now we have to get the child's assent. That was Bill Bartholomew. Um, and he stepped and he also had a master's degree in divinity from Harvard. So when these two theologians were debating, and he's a pediatrician, uh, he stepped in and said, I can I can mediate this dispute. Father McCormick and Reverend Ramsey. Here's how you do it. You, you create this thing called IRBs, which sort of didn't exist, institutional oversight. And they review the protocols to make sure that they're not too risky or that they're safe enough, that either they're minimal risk or the risk-benefit ratio is satisfactory. And that the protocols are well designed so that the research is actually going to produce something beneficial. A lot of research studies are risky with no benefit because they're poorly designed studies or whatever. And he said you can only do studies on kids if the knowledge can only be obtained by doing the studies on kids. So if you think back to Willowbrook, it's actually pretty interesting. Willowbrook, could Krugman have done his studies on the staff at Willowbrook who were also in this environment where hepatitis was endemic? and who were also getting infected with hepatitis at very high rate? And the answer is yes, he could have. And in fact, if you read a couple of his papers, he asked the staff to volunteer for these studies. So if you can do it on adults, you got to. But, and so what sorts of studies can you do on adults? Treatments of NICU, you know, necrotizing anarcholite, treatments of diseases that only affect babies, or things like pharmacokinetic studies in kids where you have a, you've seen, you have reason to believe that uh, drug metabolism is different, treatment of asthma in kids, different than the treatment of asthma in adults, so you can't really extrapolate the data. You've got to do the study in kids. Um, they came, Bartholomew came up with categories of risk now, and he said, you can do studies in kids, but they can't be risky, and what does risky mean? no greater than the risk of discomfort than would be encountered by the child in his family life. Again, where possible, it's done on adult subjects. Informed parental consent is mandatory, and he said you have to get the, um, con he, could, he said consent of the child and later changed it to assent. Um, and this eventually got incorporated in the federal regulations that we now all live with. I mean, it was really uh, came out of this debate where the IRB decides how risky it is and therefore uh, what sort of oversight is necessary or whether it's um, even perm permissible. And this gets into more of the current event stuff where today if you submit a protocol involving children or to a certain extent other incompetent people, they put it into one of these four categories. Are you familiar with these? Have you submitted protocols to the IRB? Mm -hmm. the fellows may not be as familiar. Yeah. So you have, you have to decide, and then they decide whether you're right, whether your proposed research study has no greater than minimal risk. And all these phrases are fraught with the ambiguity. Minimal risk is defined as no greater than the risk of everyday life. But what does that mean? I mean, <coughs> everyday life for whom? Does that mean? Uh, if the kids you want to study live in a more dangerous part of town, their risks of everyday life are higher, and therefore you can do riskier studies on them. Is the norm some hypothetical population norm of everyday risk? We don't know. And IRBs decide in arbitrary ways. Category two, greater than minimal risk, and that there's a prospect of direct benefit. So this is most clinical trials you're trying a new drug and you think the new drug is actually going to help and be better than the old drug. So there the IRB doesn't decide whether it's minimal risk or greater than minimal risk. They decide if the risks is 
risk or it's proportional to the benefit. Third category is uh, there's no prospect of direct benefit like in minimal risk, but you can have a minor increase over minimal risk. Minimal risk is hard to define. Minor increase over minimal risk is even harder to define, but this is understood as a category that is, okay, maybe if it's good science, a little risky, but not too risky. And finally, research with no prospect of direct benefit. That's even riskier than a minor increase over minimal risk, whatever that is. But that, somebody determines, is so important and so likely to yield valuable information that it ought to be done anyway. Those are the four categories. And then there's four levels of review then, or, or, or oversight. If it's no greater than minimal risk, child has to assent, at least one parent has to consent, or uh, a lot of people say parents don't, you can only consent for yourself. Parents give permission, they don't consent. The IRB has to approve and decide that it's no greater than minimal risk. If it's greater than minimal risk, the prospect of your benefit, risk benefit, trade-off is the same. Again, assent to the child permission of one parent. Once you get to minor increase over minimal risk, both parents have to consent, so a somewhat higher level of parental scrutiny. And the IRBs are charged to scrutinize the science itself a little bit more. So you can get away with minimal risk studies that the IRBs think are useless because, okay, there's no benefit to anybody, but there's no risk either, so who cares if you want to waste your time? Bless your heart. Once you get up to minor increase over minimal risk, the IRB can say, your study is not powered to answer the question. We're not going to approve it based on the science because it was, yeah. Um, and interestingly, with this minor increase over minimal risk, they do a tweak on the definition of minimal risk. And this has been subtly controversial, too, where they say, not the risk of everyday life. It's risks commensurate with those in the child's actual or expected mental, me, me, mental, medical, dental, psychological, social, or educational situation. So what is that little tweak? How is that different from the risk of everyday life? Well, kids who have certain medical conditions are likely to be in the hospital more or be exposed to, to higher stuff. risk things. Yeah. And therefore, if you wanted to do a study, say, that involved doing an LP, and you said, I want to do it on 100 school kids from a local public school, people would say, no. Minor increase over minimal risk, but not commensurate with those in the child's actual. But if you wanted to do it on someone with ALL, who was getting LPs every six months as part of the treatment protocol, and you wanted to do an extra one, they could say yes. Does that seem fair? That means kids who are already screwed get screwed more. Like their life sucks? Okay. Make it suck even more. It would be different if they were counting their LP as the same one that they were doing anyways. And then it wouldn't, then it would be probably considered minimal risk rather than minor increase for minimal risk. Or, I mean, if you're using, say, scavenged specimen, okay. and you do the LP, there's a little CSF left over. Yeah, that's, that's no minor increase okay. of minimal risk. If you want to do an additional LP or an additional biopsy or even an additional MRI, People argue whether MRIs are, you know, psychologically stressful. Yeah. Yada, yada, yada. You can do, it's much easier to get it approved to do an MRI in kids who have a brain tumor and are getting MRIs than. So it, it's, uh, and it's the justification for phase one studies. Who do we do phase one studies on? Kids with cancer because being exposed to a potentially dangerous drug is part of their everyday uh, medical experience. But if you wanted to get those under 
with healthy school children and say, let's try this experimental drug. So it's, it's the reasons for it are easy to understand, but the, the sort of moral basis for it, I think, is harder. Um, but so, so in theory, if you had somebody who's on death row in Texas, as an example, you could probably do anything on them because they're going to be executed anyway. So anything is acceptable for them. Although they are presumably competent adults, so they wouldn't fall into this. But if you, if you had an if you had a, a severely retarded death row, like in half of the people in Texas on death row. <laughs> um, but prisoners are a special category with their own special rules. So uh, don't do a prisoner. Do someone who's dying of cancer. Mm. Can you do more risky studies on people who are dying than you can on people who are not dying? And in the past, people have. So a lot of the radiation experiments in the 50s and 60s, uh, these studies where they injected live cancer cells, they were all done on people dying of cancer. And the argument was, how can you arm these people? They're dying anyway. Which sort of makes sense. Uh, of course, you could argue that any results you get might not be generalizable because these people are dying of cancer. And that would be a study design thing, but some might. I mean, uh, I mean, I mean you could do the same problem with phase one studies done in kids with cancer, the pharmacokinetics. Well, so what we've done instead is we've just delegated it to third world countries. Yes, well, that's, uh, I'm not going to get into that in today's okay. talk, but uh, third world countries or um, I mean, there are people who are professional research subjects, mm. and you can actually make a pretty good living. These things. Just so, I mean, it's sort of like selling your blood, but um, there are these for-profit, what are they called, CROs, clinical research organs that you've probably seen, Pintiles, yeah. based in Kansas City. It's one of the things, if you have a study and you want to get 100 people, you call up Quintiles and for a price to deliver you 100 people. How do they do it? They sign up, people pay them to be available for research studies. And uh, there's a good article on it called Guinea Peking in the New Yorker, actually, now in the medical journal. So something related to that. Yeah. Some of these uh, private practicing people, if, if the drug company does a study through them, then they don't have a formal IRB as opposed to like an academic institution. Like why, why, is that so, why is it so different if you're yeah. in private practice? And why is it I mean, part different? of the quirk of the IRB oversight system is this being America, which is a, uh, has a complex system of government. It's not illegal to do research that doesn't meet federal regulations. It just disqualifies you for federal funding. So the punishment generally, I mean, it's illegal to harm people. So if you actually harm someone, they could sue you. But if you're in private practice, not in an academic institution, and you enroll people in study and they're grateful, and you do the study and you don't get any federal money, they can't touch you. Even though you're getting the drug company money every time you enroll a patient. Right. Uh, what happens in academic medical centers is the feds have sort of extended their reach by saying, even if you're doing a study that's not federally funded, your institution is federally funded. So you work here, you're a fellow, your stipend comes through Medicare money. Therefore, if you do a study, Children's Mercy will lose its federal funding. So they police you. Children's Mercy polices you under half of that. But if you weren't here, you wouldn't have to. Medical journals now say they won't take studies that weren't IRB approved. So if you wanted to publish your results, you'd have to find an IRB somewhere. And if you were a doc in private practice, you could even either get an affiliation with a medical center just for the purpose of getting IRB approval, or there are now for-profit IRBs, where for $3,000 you can submit your program. And uh, they're uh, licensed, <coughs> considered legitimate. And I mean, most drug companies use a central IRB, which is one of these 
for profits and they submit uh, all of the private practitioners in mass to the IRB and get the protocols approved all at once. For all those interviews? Yeah. The IRB is actually on the drug company payroll. Yes. <laughs> well, they're an, they're an independent contractor. But, and, and people are so cynical about that. But, I mean, to me it seems sort of like when you hire a lawyer. I mean, you hire a lawyer to help you do what you want to do without breaking the law. And you pay them, and they give you legal advice. In a sense, IRBs kind of do the same thing. I mean, they keep you from breaking the law, and make sure your protocol is compliant. And so, I mean, in a way, it has to do with the IRBs, I think, have uh, overlapping dual functions that can be separated if you want to be a little theoretical about it. One is compliance, and one is ethics. You know, one is law and one is ethics. Often those overlap. What's illegal is unethical, what's legal is ethical, but they don't always overlap. So there are things that are legal but not ethical, or illegal but arguably ethical. So like, for me to survey you guys about your career choices, to me, would be ethical. But if I didn't get IRB approval, it would be illegal. Well, depending on what you're going to do with it, if I just sort of informally said, well, what are you planning to do next year? And you told me, I'm surveying them, but I'm not doing it systematically, and I'm ah, not publishing thank it. Thank you. So what, and I'm not, it's not illegal to do that. So what's the definition of research? Well, definition of research for the purpose of these guidelines is an activity designed to lead to generalizable knowledge. So if you say, uh, nothing that I learned by talking to these guys will I ever generalize from. I'm mentoring. Tell me what you want to do with your career. Let me give you some advice. Yeah. But if I want to write a paper about how Allergy Fellows' career choices have changed over the last 10 years, that's generalizable knowledge, and it becomes research. Think about it. The, the level of risk to you is exactly the same arguably, unless you think somehow publishing aggregate data invades your privacy in a way that counseling you in private uh, does not. And it also means, of course, that if I'm working in the clinic and, uh, you know, there's two formulations of albuterol that I could prescribe for kids with asthma, and I decide I'm going to do it uh, based on how I feel today. So today I'm going to use treatment A, and tomorrow I'm going to use treatment B. And I'm not going to look at whether one's working better than the other. I just don't care. I'm not doing research. Don't need IRB approval. But if I say, boy, wouldn't it be interesting to know whether treatment A is better than treatment B? Or the other way around. I'm going to collect data. Suddenly I'm doing research. No. This gets back to whether it's riskier or less risky. I'd say if you do the research, it's less risky. But the current system of regulation it would fall under the IRB umbrella and you need to get approval. Neither of the treatments are experimental. IRBs are not charged to uh, oversee what's experimental or not experimental. They're charged to oversee what's research or not research. This last category, the greater than minimal Greater than minor increase over minimal risk, but so important that it's worth doing anyway, has to go to a federal panel. So if the IRB decides, yeah, this is really important, but minor, it's greater than a minor increase over minimal risk and no prospect of direct benefit to the patient, they send it to Washington, and Washington convenes a panel of experts. They review it, and they make a decision. It takes months to years. Uh, and it's a real pain. It's called the 407 review process. Because it's in the section of the federal rigs. Um, what are the problems? Overemphasize the risks of research. Um, un Underemphasize the risks of using unstudied, non-validated, innovative therapies in clinical practice. The review process is labor-intensive. Local IRBs can be wildly inconsistent. So. Uh, and people find this out. I forget if I put these slides in. I don't think I did. Um, people have done multi
multi center studies where they take the exact same protocol to 20 different IRBs and get 20 different responses, ranging from expedited approval three days go ahead to four months suggestions for multiple revisions of the protocol and the consent form and everything else. And there's no oversight process for different IRBs, so you can't appeal that decision. <laughs> if your stock IRBs are totalitarian, autocratic, and absolutely unaccountable. If I don't like what the IRB concludes, can I just go to a different IRB and get a different result? Well, you can't if you're doing the study here. No, but if I'm in practice or somewhere sure. else, I can yeah. shop around for the IRB that gives me the results I like. You could. And as long as it's a duly authorized, federally recognized IRB, then you're fine. Mm. And what happens in the multi-center studies then is uh, people can do them some places but not others, so it actually ends up screwing up the science sometimes. Well, interestingly, other times, there's one famous example of a protocol uh, that was a multi-center trial and 19 IRBs approved it and one didn't. And I'll tell you the protocol and you tell me who you think was right. Ready? The study was a drug company sponsored study of an artificial blood substitute. So instead of using real blood, they developed a, a artificial blood. And the advantage of artificial blood would be you don't have to type it and it doesn't go bad. So it was primarily designed for use in emergency situations. So here was the study. They put this on ambulances. When ambulances went to the scene of traumas, they would randomize people without consent because these were trauma victims who were in desperate need of blood and in case of to real blood or fake blood, bring them back to the hospital and continue giving them either real blood or fake blood for 12 hours, at which point they'd be taken off the protocol and then they'd look at survival and neurologic outcomes. Sounds pretty shady. Why? What's the problem? The people can't consent. And you could do it on people who needed more routine transfusions or something instead of having to do it. In a life threatening situation. Yeah, I think it's a life threatening situation where you don't know that it's going to help versus, like you're saying, to somebody who you just get a regular transfusion to. So you could do it on people getting open heart surgery, say. They could consent before. Who could consent before? Okay, so they're picking a vulnerable population. Their argument against that was nobody would use this ever for people at open heart surgery because you don't need it. Blood's available. The people who need blood, untyped blood emergently, are people in the field. Uh, and therefore, the population for whom this is ultimately going to be used is the population we want to study. But you can still study it initially in a population where it's not a life-threatening thing. Well, they've done the equivalent of phase one. So they had tried this. Oh. So they they'd done a kind of proof of concept. They'd shown like that. They did on Jehovah's Witnesses or something. I don't know. Who don't well, they, they, they would ultimately be. So they already knew it was non-toxic and that it was, yeah. at least there was some evidence that it might be effective. So, That's right. So the risk isn't as high as it sounds. It sounds terrible if it's just the first time you're going to give it to right. anybody, but that's not what it is. It was actually already known that it was likely to be effective. And tried in animals. And yeah. The other okay. studies, and there were it, what were the risks, or what did they find in previous? Uh, well, the, so the question yeah. is, carry oxygen, could deliver oxygen in, in a stable patient, right. and the risks were minimal. Yeah. So expensive. 19 approved it, and one didn't. Yeah. So you said that one was, there was, which was right and which was wrong, but we don't, there's no right or wrong answer. We don't know. Well, the, the objection the one came up with was a little different than the one that you've come up with so far. They said, doing this in the field makes perfect sense. Continuing it once you get to the hospital does not. That is, in the field, this would be necessary, but just for the same reasons that you shouldn't study this on cardiac patients for whom a blood bank and good blood is available. You shouldn't continue the study once they get to the hospital. What you really want to find out is 
can you keep them alive so they get to the hospital where they can get plugged. So randomizing in the field, fine, get them to the hospital, fine. If that additional 12 hours, not fine. Except for that you don't know how much effective, you know, that the blood later is going to have. Like, I mean, there's a chance that you stabilize them enough, but then they still need further blood, and so you're not sure if you if they really did well because they got true blood or the synthetic blood later. Like, I think that skews your results a little bit. And right. You have to consider that you're assuming that there's always going to be blood available, and that at a mass trauma, how how you're going to say that you're going to have enough available blood, and so I mean you're you're trying to find out if in worst case scenario is this a, is this a useful product or a so, small so, hospital where they don't have access. Right. Yeah. And I would argue that blood itself might not be as safe as this product. Blood has com has complications. Mm -hmm. All true. Um, so the question is. Could you, could you um, answer these other interesting scientific questions, like what would we do in a mass casualty situation, without denying one of the, one of the rules of doing research is you can't deny people a current standard of care. And so the current standard of care in the field is failing. You're giving them in the field, yeah, maybe I misrepresented the study, you're giving them in the field saline versus artificial blood. Once you get to the hospital, the current standard of care is blood. So could you continue to randomize them to artificial blood versus saline? The point of giving saline is more just a volume issue rather than blood. But that's all they carry. It's a way for the follow-up. Yeah, I was wondering how they would give blood in an ambulance. Depending on the type of um, like substance this is, like whether you consider it to be a crystal blood or colloid, like I don't know that it's going to make that much difference. I mean, you're just trying to increase the over volume. Yeah, exactly. So well, but the, the study question was that, that's what we do now. Right. And everybody knows it has problems. If people have lost so much blood, if they've lost enough oxygen carrying capacity. Right. So. But that's not a standard, like you're not denying them real blood then. That's a different situation, I think. Because the way that you. Feel. Right. You're, yeah. not, you're not denying them like blood, you're still just denying them saline. Which is right. Like, and that's why it's declared that it's justifiable to yeah. do that in the field. Once they get to the hospital, if you continue it, you are denying them. And so once you get to the hospital, you they are continuing either saline or the product. That's what they were. That. Yeah. To, okay. not, to, yes. not, so I'm, I'm, to not continue it. I thought you were saying they get real blood and the yeah. synthetic thing in the field, that. and then in the hospital get real blood or synthetic. Right. But, but that that makes a difference, I think. Yeah. You know, once they get to the hospital, they should get <clears throat> either blood or the yeah. product. And, right. yeah. But there's usually a relative who could consent for them at that point. Because you're... Right. The point yeah. of this is that you're not, not right really away, trying to substitute it for blood. You're trying to substitute it for saline, which is completely... Different. You're trying to decide if crystalloid and colloid, what the difference is, and say, can With the you idea of the getting it FDA approved for mm. use in right. these situations, which would then, and I mean, you know how FDA approval works. If you get it approved for one thing, then you can use it for anything mm -hmm. in a non-controlled, mm -hmm. so if the FDA approved this for use just on the ambulances, then mm -hmm. people would start using it, and the drug company could sell it. So they were trying, and, and part of the reason they wanted to Cynics suspect part of the reason they wanted to continue in the hospital was to lay the groundwork for making the case. But they needed to do not was just better than saline, but it's just as good as blood. They needed to confine it to trauma victims who were Jehovah's Witnesses and wouldn't they accept blood. There you go. <laughs> there you go. It took a while to get that study populated. And so, like you say, you had to prove to like as you arrive, the situation that you wanted to prove and want to go to them instead of. Uh, they shut down the study, yes. That's why you haven't heard them, based on this one IRB. So, I mean, my point was really multiple IRB reviews can lead to wild idiosyncrasies, but sometimes they seem to lead to sort of one IRB being a little more careful and insightful and raising questions that then everybody thinks about and goes, you know. Um, so, our you know, our IRBs, are the outlier IRBs sort of lunatic fringe risk averse, or are they 
canary in the coal mine. I'm sensitive to. Seems like it would work that way, though. If 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 19 say it's safe and one says it's bad, then the others will say, well, okay, it's bad. But if 19 say it's bad and one says it's safe, it's not likely the others will say, oh, you're right, it's safe. They're always going to err on the side of being error on risk averse. Yep. Yeah. If you think about IRBs and the way the system works, I mean, George Mercy's IRB's job, in theory, is to protect research subjects. But in fact, their job is to protect children's mercy from losing all its federal funds. So their client, if you will, is less the research subject, more the hospital. And the feds who oversee this have been, in the past, quite random and arbitrary in their sanctions. So they'll shoot into an institution, review IRB records, and uh, shut down entire research programs at major prestigious universities, like in the past Duke and Hopkins, and uh, often for what seem to outsiders to be fairly minor uh, transgressions. Uh, I mean, every once in a while, there's a death of a research effect, but the research is risky. But it also gets the question of whether that was because the IRB lapsed or because the research is risky. And you can have a well-designed, carefully monitored research that has known risks, and somebody will be harmed. Look, if the risk is one in a thousand, and you do a thousand of them, there's a chance you're going to get what's going to happen. happen. That's statistics. There you go. <laughs> but right. if you flip a coin three times and it's hit each time, what are the odds can be hit the next time? Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly have a way of provoking a lot of thoughts in our minds. My head's spinning now, and I thought I would be not a little bit. So, that's very interesting. Um, I think we're going to have to let the fellows go to their statistics course, speaking of statistics. So you're you're to come back and talk with us again, aren't you? I think that's been scheduled. Are you planning to do it? Uh, would, would you come back and I, I'd some more? be happy to, but I don't know if it's scheduled. Okay. It might be. Well, Dr. Dowling, he's, he's the scheduler. <laughs> um, no, I know there's a serious, and I think this is based on the first of the series uh, for pediatric research that Dr. Jones helped me get organized. Um, I think you're the first one, then Greg Kearns, and Dr. Jones, I think, is giving two of them. Um, <laughs> that if I came back, I'd do current controversies, ECMO, well, fetal you. surgery for my own and and well, hypothermia. Can, can, you, can you tell us the answers for the pretest? Because that has just been a little for the ECMO and the... Oh, uh, did I? Uh, oh, see, yeah, I didn't... Did I have ECMO on there? See, I didn't even get to... Yeah. Yeah. Liberal hepatitis studies could have been done on children. Because uh, wasn't it done on children? Uh, yeah, oh, sure. uh, no, adults. That's what yeah, I thought. Have could have been done on adults. The true. answer to that is true. 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 If they would... False at first. Yeah, and then I... We talk about the truth. So you learned yeah, something. <laughs> ECMO <laughs> has never been properly evaluated in a multi-center prospective randomized trial. My guess is that's probably true. I think that's true. Because neonatologists... Oh, there was a random oh, wow. In the U.S. trial. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a randomized controlled trial, though. It's an observational. No, no, no. Oh, is that no, a randomized? No, no, no. Randomized. Oh, okay. Does it work? Look at the numbers. Mortality rate is 30% on ECMO, 60% on conventional therapy. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. And then the cerebral infection. So you have to give it to everyone then, don't you? <laughs> cerebral hypo, hypothermia is safe and effective treatment for perinatal asphyxia. Yeah, I gave the question for the part of the talk I didn't get to. That's true. Oops, I didn't even have slides on that. Um, they have, it's actually out of protocol now, like they do it. Like they do it, but I don't think they have it out of the trial. They pick it up. I know we have Yeah. Yeah. So it's interesting about approval, because who would approve cerebral hypothermia? How do you do cerebral hypothermia? You get an ice bag and cool it. Yeah. yeah, we did that. Right. So who approves that? FDA? No. It's ice. It's not a drug. It's a <laughs> It's not a device. 
one that you could argue is cool. So there is no approval. Or some people say, some people do whole body hypothermia. And the right. way they do that is you just turn down the warm-up. Right. There's right. no device, there's no drug, there's no right. nothing. So the answer is nobody approves. So how could you, is it approved or not? No. It is not approved or not and because there is no approval. But the study approved. Yeah, but if, yeah. There's no, if there's no one to approve it, how can it be? There's no approver. So well, my true. I mean, I think I think the, the people who can who do it and safe and effective, work. not approved. Yeah. That's, that's my so, question. Yeah. Say safe and effective treatment. So then, true. Uh, yes, yeah, I would say that's uh, true. I mean, because they I did it. They, is, they did it in a lot of research. There have been a Experiment. number of randomized control trials yeah, exactly. and meta analyses. Mm -hmm. We're going to stop here. Thank you, Dr. Lantos. Um, we'll resume again on Monday. Have a great weekend, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to www.acaai.org. See you next time.